the grandeur. It's called the Great Hall. The Great Hall. And it is a perfect 50 by 50 box. The opulence. 70 rooms, but that includes servants' quarters. Of course. Mm -hmm. Gold everywhere. Vaulted and intricate ceilings. Wealth built from a railroad empire. When railroads came into existence here, it changed the country completely. An emergence then, just as revolutionary as social media, e-commerce, and space exploration now. Look at those figures that are up there. And those are life-size. Those are life-size. A home so big it has a name. The Breakers, vacation home to the powerful and famous Vanderbilt family. ABC News getting a tour from Leslie Jones and Trudy Cox, historians for the Newport, Rhode Island estate, one of several historic mansions here. There aren't that many guest rooms. The way that this house is designed and the society was designed, that you're in Newport, you should already know everybody else who's here. This massive summer home, now a museum, a relic from the Gilded Age, a time in this country from the late 1870s to the turn of the century, during which a small group of powerful families like the Vanderbilts, the Rockefellers, the Astors, and the Carnegies amassed extreme wealth. And behind the luxury of the Breakers, a staff of 40 servants. All of this for the family to spend just two months of the year here. It's an age of unprecedented wealth, creation of amazing technological innovation, like the advent of electricity, <laughs> electric lights. We don't think of railroads as high tech, but they were high tech in those that changed days. changed everything. Yeah, the population is booming. Uh, America's rolling uh, westward. So it's a great age of expansion, growth, optimism, dynamism. From HBO's series, The Gilded Age. This is the age of achievement, Mr. Russell. An age when anything is possible. I like that. To the 2022 Met Gala Red Carpet's Gilded Age dress code, the era and its excess still carries influence. <laughs> Historian Edward O'Donnell says as much as the Gilded Age is defined by its extravagance, it's also defined by feelings of uncertainty driven by the working class. It's a time of unprecedented social turmoil. From 1880 to 1900, there are 37,000 strikes. And there's also great turmoil about immigration, about political corruption. There's no, you know, if you don't like a particular politician, uh, you can vote them out of office. But how do you vote Vanderbilt or uh, Carnegie or Rockefeller out of their position? You can't. They can shape politics, get tariff policy in their favor, get labor laws stymied. The Gilded Age is very much a time of sort of a tale of two kinds of America, one where things are going great, and at the same time, there's a lot that people are saying, we seem to be heading in a really dark direction. Sound at all familiar? Unions battling big corporations? At some point, you have to say no. We're not going to take this anymore. Concerns about wealth inequality. Our economy has grown better and better for those at the very top. Anxiety over immigration. I like immigration, but it's, they've got to come in legally. And fears the country is headed in the wrong direction. With the upcoming election further highlighting economic anxiety, and with the U.S. seeing more billionaires than ever before, some historians believe we could be experiencing a second Gilded Age. We did many things policy and law-wise in the 1980s, 90s, that changed the game, that changed our tax structure, changed almost eradicated regulation of Wall Street and so forth, and so that the rules have changed in the favor of the super wealthy. Looking at wealth distribution in the U.S., the top 10% of households hold 62% of the country's wealth, compared to the 5.7 held by the bottom 50%. The combined net worths of just the top five richest Americans on the Forbes list reaching $840 billion. That extreme wealth showing once again in mega mansions like this $250 million estate and super yachts sailing around the world sold for hundreds of millions of dollars, including this one, the world's largest sailboat owned by Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. This is a level of inequality that is unsustainable, that's bad for our economy, and that's bad for everyone. Janelle Jones is Vice President of Policy and Advocacy at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth and was the first black woman to serve as chief economist at the U.S. Department of Labor. Over the past 45 years, CEOs have made over a thousand times more than a typical worker. 
For the typical worker, the pay has only increased 24%. Last year, CEOs made more than 300 times the typical worker. Jones also previously worked as chief economist and policy director at Service Employees International Union, made up of two million members of industries like healthcare and the public sector. She sees the current strikes as a sign of building frustration. I think what we saw during the COVID recession really opened workers' eyes. We saw that workers were, you know, I think workers felt like they were expendable, but knowing that you were going to work when there is a deadly disease killing your coworkers, it reinforces being expendable in a new way. Although many question the effectiveness of unions, Jones believes it's one sure path toward creating better economic mobility. In occupations and industries where unions are strong, we see that wage workers are earning more money, they have more access to benefits, we also see that inequality is less in these occupations and industries. It's less between men and women, and it's less between races. It's amazing, who, depending on who you ask on the political spectrum, labor is a bad word. Yeah, I mean, labor unions have been demonized for, for a long, long time. Years. By the 1980s, certainly a lot of Americans, without knowing why, were just like, yeah, unions are bad. Right. You know, I, I've... I, I can't really say why they're bad, but I just know they're bad or they're not good. O'Donnell says many of those thoughts were spread by big businesses in an effort to stop new unions from forming. But he says now opinions are shifting. However, there are still deep criticisms about unions and their effectiveness as some negotiations fail to lead to big pay gains or workplace changes. And newly formed unions struggle to even get corporations to the bargaining table. How did we get out of the Gilded Age and what came after. The reforms really start coming in the early 20th century, where there's a growing consensus that we need to somehow put up some guardrails, some rules about how Wall Street operates, about how trusts and corporations operate, about how workers are treated. So in the early 20th century, you see the first um, forms of labor law, which is you know establishing uh, shorter hours, eventually the eight-hour day, establishing workers' compensation. Jones believes the path to more wealth equality in this current age will require something similar, federal policy. After the COVID pandemic and the recession, we started to see the way that policy can make sure there's a floor for everyone. We started to see the way that it can raise living standards for everyone. The economy is not some you know, force that rises above us. It's not something that dictates what we can do. The economy is for us. We make the rules, we set the parameters, and we know that we can change those rules if we needed to. Today, the Breakers stands as a very real representation of not just remarkable design and spectacular wealth, but could also be a cautionary tale for the future. No longer owned by those once powerful families, the Breakers and 10 other properties were all sold or gifted to a preservation society. They were trying to establish themselves as part of the nobility right. class in this country. And that's, again, with the Gilded Age, that is, they, they were, the influence they were having over the people in this country because of their wealth right. exactly. was remarkable. Yeah. And this was just like a big flex. You know what <laughs> exactly. I mean? Like uh, yeah. To use a contemporary term, contemporary a huge term. flex.